When you immerse yourself in the story through mindfulness, you're going to captivate your audience too. Creative solutions are the best contributions we make. Welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. On the show, it's my job to tease out the creative solutions my guests are coming up with to change the world through creativity, social action, and mindset. I also give you tips and techniques so you can do the same. This episode is brought to you by my class, Meditation for Busy People, where you can discover clarity and joy in just five minutes a day. It's also brought to you by the Brain FM app and this podcast host, Podbean. Also, follow the podcast on Instagram or TikTok and check out our shop for merch, music, and musings. The links are all in the show notes. Hey there, and welcome to the Creative Solutions Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Thank you for taking the time to be here. This is part two of mindfulness and public speaking. Last time we talked about this, we talked about the various facets of mindfulness and how they can improve your public speaking skills from body scanning and awareness to getting into and staying in the present moment to enhancing your nonverbal communication. Mindfulness helps. Well, today I want to finish up this two part episode of how mindfulness and mindfulness practices and techniques can benefit and improve your public speaking skills. Last time I started and then went, you know what, I'm going to change it up a little bit and make this a two part episode because there's so much to say about this. Now I want to talk about storytelling. One of the things that happens to me when I'm telling stories is that ideas come to me fast and furious, and there are some stories that I probably have told so many times that I know just how to say them, and I know just what to do to get the desired effect. And I love telling those stories, especially when I'm doing stand-up comedy. I have a lot of fun doing stand-up, and I have a lot of fun telling stories like Eddie Izzard does. The way she tells stories in her comedy is exactly the way I would love to if I were anywhere near as gifted as she is. Don't get me wrong. I know she practices. I know she works at it. But she's also an incredibly naturally gifted comedian. So, but, But that part of it, that part of being able to tell stories in such a way that you engage your audience and have them at the edge of their seats waiting and ready to hear what happens next is a gift. And if you can harness that gift in your public speaking, wow, will things really skyrocket and blast off. And one of the best ways to do that is to stay present, is to get mindful and stay present. And why? Why is being present so important when it comes to your public speaking skills? In part, it's because you are available, you are flexible and you're available and you're receptive to inspiration. Certainly that's a huge part of it. And another part of it is that you are receptive to your audience. You can see immediately what is happening, what is working and what isn't working with your audience as you're telling their story. Uh, Once you're telling that story, you can see what's happening to them and with them. And you can make minute and sometimes big adjustments in what you're doing because you're not doggedly following a particular predetermined path. Instead, you are open and present and receptive to what's going on around you, to the energy, to the feelings, to the state of being of the people you're speaking with. And you're able to then use that to be flexible, to be receptive, and to, again, make those changes that you need to make if you need to make them to your body language, to the way you're saying things, to the words themselves, all of it. So when we tell stories, we have to acknowledge that storytelling is a powerful tool for captivating an audience, but it does require being fully present in the narrative. Mindfulness allows you to immerse yourself in the story you're sharing and therefore make it more vivid and more relatable. And in addition to that, of course, as I said a minute ago, being able to play more with the audience because you are so present and accounted for. So through sensory detail visualization, this technique, you're going to add depth to your stories by envisioning the settings, the characters, and the emotions involved. This very mindful approach transports your audience into the heart of your narrative, and it leaves a lasting impression. And here's how you do it. Before you share a story, take a minute to vividly visualize the setting, the characters, and the emotions involved. Remember it if it's a memory, really flesh it out for yourself if it's something that you are making up as you go along, but know what it is on the most visceral levels. When you immerse yourself in the story through mindfulness, 
you're going to captivate your audience too. Here are a couple more mindfulness techniques that that are going to elevate your storytelling. One, emotion mapping. Storytelling is not just about sharing events. It's about conveying emotions and connecting with your audience on a deeper level. This technique involves mapping the emotions within your story to ensure that you express them authentically and effectively. So before sharing your story, take a moment to sit quietly and close your eyes. Take a few deep breaths to center yourself. Now mentally revisit the events and emotions within your story. As you relive the moments, identify the core emotions present in each part of the narrative. Are there minutes and moments of excitement, fear, joy, sadness, hope? Observe how these emotions flow throughout your story and how they build tension and engagement. Once you've identified the emotional arc or journey of your story, I'm going to invite you to connect with those emotions as you retell the story. Allow yourself to fully experience each emotion, feeling it in your body as you speak. This genuine emotional connection will add authenticity and depth to your storytelling, and it's going to leave a lasting impact on your audience. And I can hear what you're thinking, actually. You might have even said it out loud. Yeah, who's going to let me stand there and just close my eyes and do nothing for two minutes while I come up with all of these emotions? Well, here's the thing, and this is something that's interesting, and I think it's fabulous. Invite your audience to do it, too. Before you tell a very particularly emotional story, before you're going to get into that space of doing this technique, ask the audience to do it with you. Talk them through sitting quietly and connecting with themselves. And while they're connecting with themselves, you're connecting with the story you're about to tell. There's nothing wrong with the pause. And in fact, I love the pause. Embrace the pause. Take the pause and make sure that you use it wisely for yourself and for your audience. Here's the second technique, engaging your senses. When you tell a story well, it evokes vivid images and sensations in the minds and hearts of your listeners. This technique is going to involve fully and mindfully engaging your senses while you're sharing the story. It makes it more captivating and it immerses people more into it. And here's the practice. Find a quiet space to practice your storytelling. Take a moment to ground yourself by taking a few deep breaths. Close your eyes if it helps you focus. As you begin to share your story, mindfully engage your senses. Describe the sights, the sounds, smells, tastes, and textures present in your narrative. Imagine you're experiencing the events firsthand. Let your senses guide your storytelling. For example, if your story is about a walk in the woods, describe the vibrant colors of the leaves or the gentle rustle of the wind through the trees or the earthy scent of the forest floor or the soft touch of moss on your fingertips. By engaging your senses, you create a more immersive experience for your audience. You're going to transport them into the world of your story, and you're going to make it more relatable and memorable. Through these kinds of mindfulness techniques, you're going to infuse your storytelling with authenticity, emotional depth, and vivid imagery. And you're going to make a profound impact on your audience and leave them eager to hear more from you. As I said earlier, one of the things that I really want to encourage you to do is to embrace the pause. I, in this show, often take, and when I'm interviewing, I take a minute and I even describe it. I say that it is uh, anticipatory air. In in radio, they call, when, when there's nothing on, they call it dead air. And you're never supposed to have dead air on the radio. You're always supposed to have a PSA or a sweep from one song to the other while you talk over it or a commercial or a segue or something. You're supposed to always have something. Dead air is an anathema. And I've thought about that and I thought, you know, I kind of like dead air. I kind of like anticipatory air. And that's the point is that it's not dead. I think the energy of synthesizing the information that you've just heard or learned is a fabulous thing. And giving your audience room to breathe for just a second, a, a few seconds, is a wonderful thing as well. So one of the techniques that you can use literally is pause. Just take a moment, invite them, like I said earlier, invite them to breathe with you or just sit for a moment. And yet, you know, what's really funny is people will fill the silence. And 
If you were a negotiator, I would say, you know what, that's a good thing. Let them fill the silence because they're going to give you more information with which you can negotiate better and come up with a deal for everybody concerned. In public speaking, they say that the 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 a pause or dead air is terrible for a speaker because it means people start fidgeting or they or you lose their interest. Well, there is a way to maintain the energy level of your speech of what's going on without filling the silence. You can do that. You can ask people to breathe. You can ask them to focus on something specific. Let's say in your in your deck, if you if you have a PowerPoint deck, I sometimes have my students focus an ah literally. To the corner of the room. Just go, ah, and sing it out of the corner of the room. Why? Because it gets them engaged. Instead of just listening, they're doing. Most people prefer to do than to just sit. So give them something to do, even while you take a pause. And there's nothing wrong at all with just taking a pause. It's a beautiful way for all of us to get into the silence a little bit, to get into ourselves, to get into our hearts and our minds and our bodies and find a way to basically chill out and get mindful, even if it's just for a few seconds, getting to that space where we're not hyper stimulated and constantly trying to respond and react to whatever stimuli are out there. If we just let ourselves focus inward, focus on our breath, focus on where we are in space and in time, there is a beautiful bubbling up of self energy. And I love self energy because it allows you to be fully yourself And how often are you fully yourself? There's something that's so beautiful and just letting yourself be you for a little bit without the labels, without I'm a mom, I'm a wife, I'm a husband, I'm a daughter, I'm a son, I'm a student, I'm a worker, I'm a doctor, I'm a whatever. Just being you, just being this beautiful, sacred being, this organism alive and well on planet Earth, just that is worthy of celebration and taking a second to just be there with that beautiful, wonderful being who is you is a lovely and incredibly relaxing and mindful thing to do. And meditation and mindfulness allows you to do that every single day. So that's why I'm so, I'm on such a mindfulness and meditation kick. (laughs) I can't even say kick. It's almost like a shift. I've shifted so much more into that space because it leaves room for abundance. It leaves room for togetherness. It leaves room for so much more than I've ever thought possible because I'm me and I'm an abundant, lovely being organism on this planet. So I highly recommend that you check out some sort of mindfulness, whether or not you're public speaking, it's a beautiful thing. But if you are speaking in public, giving everybody else room is just lovely. And I'm going to tell you a quick story before I give you the last exercise. Uh, A dear friend of mine, Petra Mayer, who was uh, the NPR books editor, died very suddenly. I can't believe it's, it's been so long already. It's almost two years ago. And uh, which is just so so strange to me that she's gone. And uh, her family uh, sort of nominated me. <laughs> they volunteer. I was told, it looks to me like you've been volunteered to uh, MC to to be the person who runs the memorial service. And I went, okay. So I held it together and I did it. Uh, and it was not an easy thing, believe me. Staying present and not not losing myself in my own grief was one of the most, I have to say, uh, amazing things I've been able to do because I didn't think I was going to be able to, but I stayed centered and I stayed present. And that was my job, was to be present and to hold space for everybody else, for her parents and her family. And why I'm talking about this is because the very first thing I had everyone do once we started is I had everyone put their feet flat on the floor, put their hands on their knees, and to just breathe, to just take a few minutes of this time that we were sharing together to celebrate her to breathe. And this is a this was a public speaking event because there I was, hundreds of people, and it was my job to sort of MC and almost host this memorial service. But what I really thought we all needed was to just be together and to breathe, to take a minute. And we went through and we did the entire service, but afterwards somebody came up to me and she said, 
you know, that most powerful thing for me this whole time was when you had us breathe to just get back into ourselves. She said, I had not taken a deep breath since I heard the news. And taking those deep breaths, it it allowed me to to sort of open back up. I realized that I was just closed. I was shut up. Since the minute I heard the news, I was shut up. And I, I, uh, when you had us breathe, I opened back up and I went, oh yeah, breathing, that's right. I can keep breathing. And when she said that to me, I, you know, the tears came to my eyes because that was the point of me asking everyone to breathe because you get you get to the point where you become frozen, you become stuck. And just taking a second, it was only about a minute that we breathed together, just taking that time to get back into ourselves allowed people who were frozen, whose spirits were frozen to open back up and and to be present and to and to live again and to remember this wonderful woman and friend and daughter and partner. Yes, of course, and she sits in my heart forever, and I can't imagine she would want us all frozen in grief for the rest of our days. I have a feeling she would probably go, hell no, nah. let's party, right? And so, so that moment in time of giving everybody just a chance to get back into themselves and a chance to breathe was magic. And I think it was her hand involved in that as much as it was mine in giving us permission to sort of breathe again. So I wanted to share that because I think it's important for all of us to remember that we are living, breathing, luminous beings. And one of the ways that we can make that connection and maintain that connection with one another is to breathe together. So the next time you're doing any sort of public speaking, if you need to breathe, invite everyone to do it with you. If they titter, if they go, tee -hee 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 -hee, it means they're uncomfortable and a little fearful. And that's okay. It's okay if they're uncomfortable and a little fearful. I can almost guarantee you that by the time you're done with that little breathing exercise, they're no longer going to be uncomfortable. They're going to be ready and present and excited to learn what you have to tell them. In case you do get a heckler, though, I want to go through and give you uh, a, a little bit of a handling sort of question and answer sessions. I won't even go into hecklers. Uh, the way to deal with hecklers for me, honestly, is to go, hey, <laughs> we're all here together, right? Generally speaking, people don't want you to fail. I know there is this, uh, my husband is a, was a clown in the circus and people did want him to fail because he was a clown. But most of the time, your audience is, is not interested in seeing you fail. Most of the time, they are quite interested in seeing you succeed because they want to know, they want to learn, and they want to have a good time. They don't want to be uncomfortable because when someone fails in front of you, it's an uncomfortable thing. And it's sad because I think we should all be able to go, well, that was a fun mistake and move on. But most of the time, that's not where we get to. So when you are in that space of you finished your your session and you're handling the question and answer period, it can be sort of the most unpredictable part of public speaking. I think mindfulness equips you to handle those impromptu questions with confidence and composure. And just like I was talking about the pause, the breathing, all of that, this is a way to do that. When you pause and then respond, you can take a mindful moment before answering a question. That simple pause, while still maintaining the energy of the gathering, allows you to gather your thoughts and respond thoughtfully, and it avoids those knee-jerk reactions, and it will ensure clear, thoughtful, and well-articulated answers. So the way to do it is, when someone asks you a question, take a deep breath and pause for a moment. Take the time to gather your thoughts and respond with calm and with peace and presence and authenticity rather than rushing into an answer, right? When you rush into an answer because you feel like you have to know everything all at once, you make it tougher for you to be authentic and probably you make it tougher for you to be right. That's something so important. And in fact, when I was teaching 
at NASA, through NASA, I should say, I was traveling all over the world teaching uh, environmental science and earth science workshops that I still do as the earth lady. I travel to schools and I teach these assemblies. People would ask me questions and I would be like, ooh, wow, great question. I don't know that answer because they'd ask something either way out of left field or that wasn't anywhere near my expertise. Now, for a long time, instructors of any kind or facilitators of any kind were taught they had to know the answer. You better know your stuff. I took a different tack. I went, oh, okay, wow, that is a great question. Uh, You know what? I don't know the answer to that. Let me look it up or find you a resource during lunch and I'll get back to you. And that was it. I didn't have to know the answers. You don't have to be the authority, the end all be all. What you need to be is someone who knows how to look for the answers. You need to be able to give them a resource. So take the time. If you don't know the answer to something, that is cool. Just go, ah, okay, I'm not sure what the answer is. Let me get back to you. And then follow it up, get back to them with the answer and you know, if it's if it's pertinent to everyone there, give it to everyone so that you put the punctuation mark on it. You are not going to go, I don't know, and then foop and flit out of existence, right? You're going to be there to give them something that's going to get them the answer they want. But if you need to take a minute to think that pause then respond, I invite you to always embrace the pause. Don't let the energy die. As I said earlier, keep your energy and therefore the audience's energy level up, but feel free to take a a second to gather your thoughts. Then come back in with certainty and passion and you'll have them on the edge of their seats. So whether you're stepping into the world of public speaking or you're a seasoned pro seeking growth, mindfulness has the potential to transform your communication skills and it's going to elevate your impact. It really is. So take some of these mindfulness skills that I've talked about over these last two episodes and use them in your public speaking, whether you're speaking to one person or a thousand people, they're going to really help you in all aspects of your life, actually, not just public speaking. So if you want to dive deeper into mastering your communication skills, I invite you to check out my workshop, Communicating Quality at IsoldaSpeaks.com. It's perfect for conferences and organizations that are looking to empower their employees with stellar communication abilities, communicating, public speaking, and also conflict resolution. But the best thing about it is that it can work for two people and it could work for 200 people. And I love, love, love doing this workshop and we'll be doing it a lot this autumn. Actually, I'm very excited about that because I think the more we are able to communicate with one another, the more we are able to listen and respond, not react, but respond to each other the better off we're all going to be because that is what gives us that ability to see it from the other person's point of view, to take it in, to listen actively and fully, and to respond with love and peace and calm. And wow, isn't that amazing when we can do that? I hope you've enjoyed today's episode of the Creative Solutions Podcast. I want you to remember to subscribe to the Creative Solutions Podcast to stay inspired and to unlock your creative potential. I'm going to be doing more uh, interviews this the next few months. Uh, it's going to be super fun. I've got some wonderful episodes coming up. Until then, though, remember that we're going to be talking about this idea of mindfulness and how it relates to just about every aspect of your life and your work. As part of this, I invite you to check out the Mindful Self-Care Handbook. This handbook it was designed to give you simple, easy, and basic ways to incorporate mindfulness and self-care into your daily routine. You can find the Mindful Self-Care Handbook at IsoldaSpeaks.com. And your voice, your mindful voice, is your power. And with that mindfulness, you can amplify the power and make a lasting impact on the world. So I invite you to keep speaking, keep growing, and keep shining. And remember, as always, I also invite you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2023. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results. 
although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living what you believe in. Thank you.